All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Hernandez. I'm a PA and I work in the cardiology clinic. And today we're going to talk about hypertension, uh, otherwise known as high blood pressure. Okay. We're going to be focusing on the AHA guideline presentation of what it is um, and what you can do about it. Okay. So what is hypertension? So that's high blood pressure. Okay. So you have two numbers for blood pressure. The top number is called systolic, the bottom number is called diastolic, and the sheet you have in front of you uh, has the different categories for that level of blood pressure. So um, <clears throat> the most current guidelines uh, feel that less than 120 over 80, that's ideal, uh, is considered elevated but not yet hypertensive if you're anywhere between 120 to 129 and still less than 80. You, are, uh, you have stage one hypertension once you hit 130 over 80, but you're still less than 140 over 90. And your stage two hypertension once you're greater than 140 over 90. And uh, I think it's important to establish why we care so much about treating hypertension, treating high blood pressure, uh, there's a lot of different consequences. Uh, I just highlighted uh, one study showing that uh, controlling high blood pressure compared to people who didn't treat their high blood pressure, there was a 35 to 40% reduction in strokes, uh, 20 to 25% in myocardial infarctions, which are also known as heart attacks. And then there was more than 50% reduction in heart failure. So those are really big uh, outcomes where uh, we can, we've seen that keeping that blood pressure under control reduces the incidence of that. You actually have a sheet here as well that points to other consequences, uh, including kidney disease, kidney failure, sexual dysfunction, uh, and it can strain the blood vessels in your eye affecting your vision, among, among many other uh, negative effects of high blood pressure. So that's why we care so much about treating it. Um, more recently, um, I'd say in the last few decades, there's been a transition from more lenient uh, blood pressure goals to being a little more aggressive about it, which is a transition for people who've been receiving care for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So more recently, uh, we've lowered the threshold at which you should be treated and the goal for treatment in general. And that's largely coming off this research study called the SPRINT trial, where we looked at people who had uh, the more lenient goal, less than 100 over 40, and we compared them to people who had uh, the more strict blood pressure control of less than 120. We looked at both men and women uh, greater than 50 years old, uh, whose baseline blood pressure was anywhere between 130 to 180 systolic. Um, they were also uh, a high-risk population we looked at. People with cardiovascular disease, people with chronic kidney disease, um, with at, at a high risk based off a of population risk score model we have, uh, or they were 75 or older. Uh, they excluded people who already had heart failure, excluded diabetes, severe kidney disease, as well as a history of a stroke. And what we saw was that the people with the blood pressure goal that was more strict at less than 120 systolic had a lower rate of adverse cardiovascular events. So that includes uh, a lower rate of heart attacks or acute coronary syndromes, stroke, death from cardiovascular cause, and acute heart failure. There was also a sub uh, a study within this study called Sprint Mind that actually showed a 19% reduction in mild cognitive impairment, uh, which suggests that controlling your blood pressure may be beneficial for cognitive function, kind of keeping your facilities as you age. So uh, in our clinic, uh, typically the more strict blood pressure goal we use is less than 130 over 80. And so some people might ask, well, we just saw that study showing that 120 was a better number than 130. And so uh, you might wonder why we use 130 instead of 120. 
Uh, and that's because when you uh, look at the people with that more strict blood pressure control, there were a lot of downsides related to being so aggressive about treating the high blood pressure. So that number is really a compromise uh, that we do. Um, some of the kind of adverse events were uh, being on uh, such aggressive blood pressure meds could hurt the kidneys. Uh, you're on a lot more medications, period. Uh, increase in uh, low blood pressure, leading people to pass out, among other things. So to try and try to try to kind of thread the needle between giving the most benefit, but also trying to reduce harm, uh, we generally aim for 130 over 80. Less than that. So uh, I think today's uh, um, talk would be beneficial to kind of give you some tools that you can do on your own at home and in cardiac rehab to try and help treat your blood pressure. So these are um, non-pharmacologic or non-medicine ways that we know lower your blood pressure. You have a handout here which basically reflects the same information. Uh, the first is weight loss. So um, weight loss can be challenging for a lot of people um, and a healthy weight looks different on everyone. But in general, a relative weight loss of five to 10% is considered significant uh, and significant enough to lower your blood pressure. So uh, for someone who's hypertensive, uh, who is overweight, it's recommended to try to pursue a relative uh, weight reduction. And something that for some people find motivating is that um, based off of the data we have, we've seen that one kilogram of weight loss uh, can result in one unit of blood pressure reduction. So it's nice that it's a bit a one-to-one -one when you're kind of making weight loss goals or seeing yourself lose weight, you can expect your blood pressure to improve that much. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, what else was I going to say about that one? Oh, yeah. So one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So about somewhere around two pounds, you can expect one unit of blood pressure reduction. Um, and um, so there's, there's that. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, and so if you compare that to the average uh, reduction in blood pressure from a blood pressure medicine, one study has shown that at a standard dose, a blood pressure medicine, a pill you take for your blood pressure, can lower it by around nine units. So that means 20 pounds of weight loss is roughly equivalent to starting a medicine. Yeah. And then separate from weight loss, if you didn't lose any weight at all, although that's ideal, simply pursuing a healthy diet uh, is associated with improved uh, blood pressure. Um, so diets rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy products uh, with reduced content of saturated fats and trans fats. Uh, so two common uh, diets are the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet. Both of those um, can improve blood pressure. And we've seen that for someone who's hypertensive, uh, approximately uh, 11 units of blood pressure improvement. Yep. You didn't mention sodium. We're going to get to sodium. Sodium is, is its own uh, category because it is so powerful to help with the blood pressure. But absolutely, low sodium. Uh, and th that'll be coming up in a second. But yeah, so just following this, you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, diet, uh, you can expect to lose as much, reduce your blood pressure as much as taking uh, a medicine, an average medicine at a standard dose. And this brings us to what you mentioned, which is salt. So um, ideally, you'd have less than 1.5 grams on a given day. That's uh, quite, um, that's not very much salt. That's a teaspoon of salt in a given day, which is hard for a lot of people to accomplish mm -hmm. because salt is in so many foods. Not even just in salty, savory foods. It's also found in sweet foods, uh, seemingly neutral foods like bread, there's a lot of salt in those things. So trying to get down to less than a teaspoon in a given day is very challenging for people, uh, which is why um, starting from whatever your intake is at and trying to reduce it 
uh, your intake by at least one gram might be more realistic. Okay, and pursuing those changes can improve your blood pressure by approximately five uh, units. And so that, for, for me, I think if there's one, when I first talked to someone about high blood pressure, if there's one lifestyle change that I would start with, it's looking at how much salt you're eating, added or intrinsic, and trying to reduce it. Uh, there are a lot of low sodium options now, uh, but this is just such a powerful thing you can really hone in on and start to see improvement in blood pressure. Another one is eating a healthy amount of potassium, not too much, not too little. Um, a general goal is 3.5 to 5 grams per day, ideally in whole foods. So trying to add things like bananas, apples, potatoes, okay? Uh, and that uh, we've seen improved blood pressure by around four to five units of blood pressure. Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of cardiac patients might have pause with because a lot of people are on warfarin and changing the potassium intake can affect your INR. Um, but uh, it's more important that you kind of adopt a healthy diet and just stay consistent with that. Um, and it, it can improve your blood pressure and your INR should stabilize and we can adjust your dose to kind of meet whatever dietary intake you're at. Physical activity, that's another really important one. And this one has benefits strictly for hypertension, but also for your general cardiovascular health and risk overall. So this is a very kind of high yield way to uh, improve your cardiovascular health and lower your risk for future adverse events. Um, and there's several different options. We'll just talk about for treating high blood pressure. So aerobic activity, um, and that's defined as 90 to 150 minutes per week, uh, or three to five days per week for 30 minutes at a time. It can be divided up. So if you wanted to do 15 minutes of a brisk walk in the morning, 15 minutes of a brisk walk at night, that would all add up to 30 minutes. And we know that's the amount uh, where we start to see benefits. Um, and some people who really track their kind of heart rate and things on whatever uh, wearable device you have, uh, if you wanted to, you could track your heart rate reserve to know that, say you were going for walks every day, but you weren't sure if it was either vigorous or enough for you to be getting the benefit, you can actually calculate your heart rate reserve. So you need to know your uh, heart rate maximum uh, or predicted maximum for your age. Um, and the way you get that is taking 220, subtracting your age in years, okay? And then you have to take your heart rate with activity, subtract it by your heart rate at rest, and then divide it by that maximum predicted heart rate subtracted by your heart rate at rest. Can we have that? Uh, I, can, I can give that to you. Um, I think this might be getting a little bit too in the weeds. Uh, uh, it's more important just that you get outside, uh, or not even get outside because I know it's rainy here, but that you get your heart rate up and you're exercising 30 minutes a day, okay, five to seven days a week. Uh, that is more in there for people who um, are just, I, there's kind of an increasing prevalence of people who track their heart rates, care a lot about those things. And so for people who like numbers and setting goals, that's there for you if you're interested. But to keep it simple, just 30 minutes, feel your heart rate getting up, not taking a lot of breaks on a brisk walk or a jog, whatever it may be. Um, and if you're in cardiac rehab, you, you'll be getting that. Most people are doing that for three days a week. And so you're kind of starting that healthy lifestyle with aerobic ex exercise. Um, if you uh, don't like aerobic exercise or say you have really bad uh, lower leg arthritis and it prevents you from going for brisk walks or jogs, uh, but your upper body is strong, you could do dynamic resistance exercise. Uh, that's what some people call weightlifting or just resistance exercise with bands. Same number of minutes per week, so three to five days per week for 30 minutes. Um, and they really dialed into uh, the specifics of your workout. So uh, whatever the most you could possibly do for one rep, cut that in half or 80% of that, okay? And work with that. Uh, 10 reps, three sets for each exercise, 
six different exercises. Um, and that uh, will improve your blood pressure. And then the third type of uh, exercise, which is especially helpful for people who uh, might be in a wheelchair or just have such severe kind of uh, chronic diseases that it prevents them from doing uh, the kind of typical exercise, is you can do hand grip exercises. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's also, it's also encouraging too if you're if maybe you're not um, the, a typical able-bodied person. You can still keep your heart healthy by reducing your blood pressure. So just because when I come here, my blood pressure always goes up. Yeah. I get excited about it. So if I just do that, yeah. So while I'm waiting for them to come, would that help immediately? Uh, help. So um, your blood pressure is going to go up as a natural response to exercise. So probably when I come in to get my first reading. Uh, this is more something that if you get in a routine of doing this at this frequency, you're going to expect your average blood pressure to re reduce your average resting blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. um, so, uh, but what the exercise is is you hold a grip for two minutes uh, and aim for. Uh, just under half of the most you could do, so 30 to 40 percent. Hold it for two minutes, rest for one minute, do that four times, okay? Do that three times a week, uh, and it, with them they did it over the course of eight to ten weeks, um, and about five units improvement in blood pressure. So uh, whether it's aerobic activity, resistance training, or just doing hand grip exercises, there is a way that you can uh, improve that blood pressure, uh, and by improving your blood pressure, um, help your heart out. Another one uh, is moderation in alcohol intake. So for men, that's defined uh, as drinking two or fewer drinks per day. For women, one or fewer drinks per day. Uh, and the standard size is here. Uh, unfortunately, most of the sizes you're going to get uh, when you go out to get alcohol are often larger than the standard size. So um, a standard size of beer is a 12 ounce with about 5% of alcohol. A typical pint you'll get is 16 ounces. So that's a little bit more than one standard size drink, which is something to keep in mind uh, if you're someone who enjoys drinking beer uh, and you go and you say, oh, well, I had, I had two beers, but if you had two pints, uh, you're above the uh, maximum uh, recommended amount. Uh, five ounces of wine, one and a half ounces of liquor, um, and a, uh, so that you can expect to see uh, four units improvement in your blood pressure as well. And then uh, one bonus, which is actually not really supported by the data at this point, or at least there's mixed data, but it's worth mentioning, um, is that a study uh, looking at device-guided breathing found that it lowered blood pressure so three units systolic, 2.5 units diastolic. Uh, and, and effectively, that's just a machine-guided meditative breathing uh, routine. Uh, and probably what's going on is that is kind of uh, uh, reducing your sympathetic nervous system. In other words, helping you relax a little bit uh, and blood pressure on average improved. Uh, but you should know that five of the eight trials were sponsored by a manufacturer, so it's not really considered high quality evidence to support it. Um, but in general, I think stress reduction is something I'd recommend to reduce that sympathetic nervous system, help with high blood pressure, and help with your heart health. The uh, box breathing that they were teaching us here, yeah. would that count for? Yes, for yes, yeah. Especially if, if you feel yourself relaxing, uh, then theoretically that's uh, kind of dialing down the sympathetic nervous system uh, and thereby kind of helping lower that blood pressure. Certainly acutely. Uh, if, so, For example, someone who's having a panic attack and their blood pressure is through the roof, if a breathing exercise helps calm them down, uh, then we, we know that the blood pressure will improve. So this is something that um, intuitively makes sense, theoretically makes sense. There's uh, not yet high quality data for it to be included but I just like to include it. I think it's part of a healthy lifestyle. Um, so that covers kind of what blood pressure, high blood pressure is, um, why it's important, what you can do. Um, 
And in addition to that, you know, our job as cardiology providers will be to help supplement what you're doing with medications, okay? Um, but I, I felt that since, you know, this was kind of more about what you could do, we'd focus on the lifestyle things. One other thing, uh, if you're checking your blood pressure at home, this handout here is really nice because it, it, it summarizes uh, the uh, best technique to check your blood pressure at home. So before you check it, go ahead and uh, make sure that you have not had any tobacco, no caffeine, uh, and no exercise in the 30 minutes prior to checking it. Um, wait five minutes after you've been sitting still and then check it. Make sure you have the right size cuff and it's on the upper arm. There are wrist cuffs. Uh, they're not necessarily bad, but most of the data we have is based on upper arm cuffs. So we recommend using an upper arm cuff. Uh, keep it on a flat surface at heart level uh, and try not to talk. Talking will raise your blood pressure. Uh, and then um, you can uh, wait one minute and recheck your blood pressure and average your readings. Um, and if you see us, um, I often uh, request one week of home blood pressure because that gives us a good idea of what your true average blood pressure is um, outside of just the clinic. So uh, that is everything I have on hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, but now I'd like to hear what your questions are about what it is, what you can do, any questions that came up. So in Say like the elevated blood pressure on the chart here. What happens if like your diastolic is, is or your, excuse me, your systolic is higher, but your lower, your diastolic is lower, so you don't quite, quite fit into the category. Yeah. So what would you call that then? Good question. If just one of them is in the range, then you're, you're in the range. So if your systolic is 120, so it's um, ideal. Uh, but your diastolic is 90, then you're hypertensive. Okay, and then we, you know, I, we would refer to it as diastolic hypertension, but we would still recommend treating it. Yeah. Which one is uh, the most dangerous, if there is one? Um, it's hard to say. Um, I think we are kind of approach both of them with the same kind of understanding that they're dangerous long-term, yeah. So, before I was, uh, before I had got high blood pressure, which wasn't that long ago, you know, five, ten years, um, if that, sometimes my blood pressure would plummet. And I, and I would feel dizzy, I'd feel kind of weak, I just didn't feel good, and I learned to just take my blood pressure, and it was always pretty low. Then I got high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a lot, you know, the, the uh, arterial system, the system that keeps your blood pressure at a normal level uh, is a pretty dynamic system. Um, and so it responds to different things. So it's hard to say what exactly what was going on when you had that drop in, those drops in blood pressure. Um, but it's also not uncommon to develop hypertension later in your life. So it's hard to say other than, you know, the second part of your story sounds somewhat typical for a primary hypertension, as long as you didn't have other strange symptoms with it, um, where it, it came on later in life. And what was going on prior, where sometimes it would go low, it's hard to say. And I think we need to know a little bit more about what was going on. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say. Um, some common causes of those uh, are people who don't drink enough water, going sitting to standing, positional changes. It's a very common cause of uh, low blood pressure with position change. If you have a condition like arrhythmia, for instance, does that um, create a higher risk than in regards to the high blood pressure, or is it not related at all? Or I th they're related. I think independently, we know that they carry their own risks if you're talking about malignant arrhythmias. Uh, and so um, 
if you have those and you're uh, chronically hypertensive, well, it's a good idea to get the blood pressure under control regardless. So, um, but there's not really currently um, the kind of disposition that hypertension plus an arrhythmia means you need to do something different about the hypertension. It's just that if there, someone is hypertensive, you should get it under control on average, get that problem under control. The arrhythmia, try and get that problem under control as well. Yeah. Excuse me, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if what are the what are the odds if if you follow you know these things to improve your blood pressure that you'll be able to get off meds, for instance? Pretty good. I mean if you if you add all those up. Um, you know, the average, as we talked about earlier, uh, the average medicine uh, at a standard dose uh, based on one study uh, can improve your blood pressure around nine units. Um, and so if you just look at, at the expected uh, blood pressure reduction, you'll see that something like the DASH eating plan is 11 units. So if you were to reduce your blood pressure 11 units and consistently maintain that, and your blood pressure is consistently low, then it's not uncommon at all that we could try coming off of one of the medicines as long as it doesn't have other benefits separate from your hypertension. So people with heart failure, they would need to be continue on their heart failure medicine. Um, but if it was purely a medicine for high blood pressure and you did those things, then the odds are quite good that you could come off at least one of them, see how your average blood pressure handles it. If it's good, then um, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. you, will, you will always be on low blood pressure medicine? Uh, I, not exactly. So uh, for heart failure, uh, there's a group of medicines, and I'll be giving a heart failure talk uh, in the middle of the month, and we'll kind of dive more into it. But there's a group of medicines uh, for um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that typically people are recommended to be on long term. Uh, those medicines overlap with blood pressure medicines. And so sometimes people uh, say, oh, my blood pressure is better. Can I stop this blood pressure medicine? Uh, but you have to remember that that is also, and sometimes primarily, a heart failure medicine. Um, but there are groups of medicines that people are on while they have heart failure that are not heart failure medicines. And we'll kind of go into it more in that presentation. Those we can come off of. But I'm asking. Yeah, and so. Great. Great, yeah. You were just saying yesterday, maybe I'll be able to get off my blood pressure. Now. So, um, you probably, depending on the severity of the heart failure or the ejection fraction and the kind of specifics of the heart failure, um, usually uh, you're, you'll be recommended to be on some amount of medicine long term. Um, but case by case, um, sometimes medications can be reduced. Yeah. <laughs> the question about the, uh, the second uh, time you take your blood pressure, um, you take your blood pressure, you wait five minutes or whatever it says here, and you retake it, and then you do an average. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the two numbers for, for an average person that's not doing anything? I mean, in between the, the two tests. So I would just have to say anecdotally, within 10 units of blood pressure usually. I see. Yeah. So the normal situation, it could be it could be ten points different from one test to another one five minutes later. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the blood pressure you know blood pressure is a very dynamic system, yeah. um, and in general, uh, it's possible you know if you started talking in between, if you moved around in between, things like that. I, I think more typically it, it's somewhere between five and ten, but that's not kind of based off any data. That's just yeah. observation. Yeah. Um, but it is also worth noting that uh, there, there is such thing as uh, blood pressure that's not primary hypertension, which I didn't talk too much about today. But there are secondary causes, and there are kind of red flags that your provider is trained to look out for that would lead us to do more testing. Uh, and one um, not particularly common, but it does exist, cause of secondary hypertension can present with uh, unequal blood pressures to a certain severity. So um, though there is a certain amount of variation between readings, if it's really significant um, and your history kind of fits it, 
then um, your provider might want to do more testing. Um, but go ahead. Uh, well, what about the difference between one arm and the other? <laughs> right. Yeah. No. So uh, some there are some things that can have significant differences between one arm and the other. But in general, for what you're asking, I would expect between five and ten units in a healthy person difference. No more than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why is it okay to get your high your blood pressure is really high, it's pretty high when you're exercising, but not? Uh, so uh, because that's basically when you start exercising, uh, your heart is doing what it's uh, basically designed to do, which is meet your body's metabolic demands for oxygen. So when you start exercising, uh, the demand for um, basically oxygen to your muscles and organs increases. Um, and so you start, your heart rate increases, uh, you start breathing faster, bringing more oxygen, uh, and your blood pressure will go up uh, to meet yeah. that kind of uh, demand of what's going on. And so that uh, we simply know is kind of the healthy physiologic way for your heart to function. And so your heart tends to be, have lower risk long term if you're doing those physical activities, you know, effectively your heart uh, is uh, well suited to do physical activity and physical activity requires increasing your heart rate, increasing your blood pressure transiently. Uh, and then there are a lot of kind of physiologic changes that happen as a, as a result uh, and long term improve your blood pressure. So um, we simply, basically, I would say we simply observe and theoretically know anatomically and physiologically that doing exercise, which causes increased blood pressure and heart rate, uh, is good long term. And in fact, it'll lower your average blood pressure at resting um, simply kind of from healthy physiologic uh, adaptation to exercise. Well, here they won't let you even start exercising if you're like over 170 or so. Yeah. Right. So, um, if, yeah, so that, that is if your resting blood pressure is really hypertensive, then going further up just to err on the side of caution, because if your blood pressure goes through the roof, you can have a hypertensive emergency, uh, which um, we want to avoid. So if your average resting is not controlled, then it's, we don't feel comfortable having you increase it yet further. So sometimes those people need to be on increased medication to bring their average down. Then they can start exercising, and then their heart and their body can start making those healthy uh, adaptations to exercise. And, and one, and the other question is, like, if you check if you're exercising, you check your heart rate, and it's high, and you stop exercising, and you can see it drop, 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 drop. That's healthy heart. Is the same goal for blood pressure? How quickly it drops when we stop? That's not something we necessarily look at. Um, there, you know. Uh, the, the question becomes is uh, when you are vigorously exercising. Yeah. Uh, and then you stop. Mm -hmm. How long does it take your blood pressure and your heart rate to come back to the yeah, normal right. resting? Uh, re yeah, I think we can probably find some 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 data on that. Um, but as far as the clinical significance of knowing that yeah. is a little bit less clear. You know, I would say somewhere between 15, 20 minutes, you would expect your heart rate and blood pressure to normalize. Well, this says, yeah, 30 minutes here. Yeah. 30 minutes, yeah, Fantastic. right. So yeah. to err on the side of caution, 30 minutes to be completely sure that you're back to your baseline. Mm -hmm. And then you sit five minutes, and it's always much lower for me. Yeah, right. So that's what you'd expect. Okay. It sounds like we've uh, kind of. Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you all, and um, that's all I've got for you. So, all right, of course.